Hi, so it looks like uh, people coming in has kind of slowed to a, a, a trickle rather than lots of people still turning up. Um, so I guess we can we can make a start. So a couple of bits of housekeeping first. So hi, I'm Natalie Cooper. I'm a senior editor at Methods in Ecology and Evolution. And this is our first ever um, Methods Live, exclamation mark. Um, so we're really excited um, to be able to do this. And massive thanks to Chrissy for, for being the first person to volunteer. Um, so if you do end up publishing a paper with us, we'd be really happy to, to have um, to host one of these for you as well, so that you can sort of express uh, share your methods more broadly um, with people within the um, the community. I think sometimes this can be an easier way of sharing perhaps than getting people to just read a paper. Um, so just wanted to say to make everyone uh, aware of the fact we are recording this so this will be put on the YouTube channel so just be aware of that and um, that we'll of course be following the BES code of conduct as we do for everything. Um, if you need to see what that is, I'm just posting that into the chat for you now. Um, so just be aware that we will be following that. Um, we're not entirely sure whether people are able to sort of put their hands up and um, unmute themselves to ask questions. But if you do have any questions at any point, um, pop them into the chat and we're gonna have a, a space sort of halfway through to answer some of those questions and also some time at the end to answer them. Um, it might be that we're able to just get people to put their hands up and, and then unmute themselves, but I'll kind of chair that question session um, and get Chrissy to answer them. So uh, without any further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Chrissy Hernandez, who's going to talk to us about her recent paper, Methods in Ecology and Evolution, looking at comparing populations to investigate how vital rates drive population dynamics. Over to you, Chrissy. Thanks so much. OK. So. All right. So share my slides um does that look okay perfect okay great um thanks so much everyone for being here um i'm really excited about this opportunity to talk to you about some recent work um that i led in methods in ecology and evolution um particularly about an exact version of life table response experiment analysis and our r package so there's a ton more information in the paper than what I'm going to cover today. I'm going to focus mostly on sort of skills today. I'm going to talk to you about um, the methods that we developed and in particular the R package. So if I go through this slideshow kind of fast, um, please forgive me for that. Um, you can rewatch it and you can go back to the paper to read some more, but I wanna make sure that we have time to go through some examples and I'm gonna share my RStudio window and actually like walk through some tu tutorial examples. And that code is also available for you to download. I'll share the GitHub link when we switch over to that part. So, um, the things we're gonna cover today, I'm gonna really quickly get us all on the same page about structured population models and then spend the bulk of this presentation portion talking about life table response experiments. What are they? What are the classical methods that have been in use for several decades? And then why do we need exact methods and what are they? Um, and I'll show you a worked example. Um, I'll also provide some advice for using exact LTRE methods and some of the input decisions that you kind of have to make to use the functions that we have. And then um, I'll pause in the middle for some questions, and then we'll switch over to looking at the R package itself. So uh, matrix models connect census data to population dynamics. Really briefly, if you were a researcher who studied penguins, you might go in year one and take a census and count how many fluffy brown juveniles there are and how many adult smooth um, swimmer penguins there are. But you can't stay in Antarctica all year. And while you're gone over the winter, um, all kinds of processes take place. You go back in year two, take another census. And the matrix model that you can build from these two sets of census data um, allows you to infer or directly represent all these processes that are taking place while you're not there. Um, and the other thing that's important here is that we're talking about a discrete time model. 
Another really important thing about matrix models is that they include population structure, which I've started to allude to in talking about juveniles and adults. Um, we can also have um, generally age structured models where individuals must move from one age class to the next every year and adults produce the youngest individuals. Those are often used in, for example, marine mammals. We can also have much more complicated models. Uh, I think of them as much denser. The matrix has a lot more non-zero entries. Um, and for example, uh, that comes up a lot in plants. Um, this is a model for common teasel um, where plants can move, individuals can move back and forth between reproductive and non-reproductive classes. And you also um, have reproductive individuals that can produce multiple types of offspring. So you end up with this much denser um, matrix. Um, and from these models, we can estimate all kinds of things. <laughs> um, and in particular, uh, researchers have focused on population growth rate, and that's what we're going to focus on today. Um, population growth rate is represented by the symbol lambda, um, which is um, the leading eigenvalue of the population projection matrix. We can also calculate the sensitivity of any of these metrics to changes in the vital rates or changes in the matrix entries. And so the conditions that a population experiences influence all those elements of its density independent discrete time projection matrix, which we call A. And then the entries of A determine the population growth rate or lambda. And most of what we're going to talk about today is at the level of matrix elements, but the analyses can also be carried out on underlying vital rates. And if that's something that interests you, um, the package isn't set up to do that. But if you'd like to talk through um, how to implement code that can do that, um, please do get in touch with me. So if the conditions that a population experiences can affect its population projection matrix and lambda, um, this is just a cartoon to show you a little bit about how that works. So here we've imagined that we censused three populations of bluefin tuna. In year one, they're all the same size. And in year two, population one has been stable. So it has a lambda value of one. Population two is declining has a lambda less than one, and population three is growing, so it has a lambda greater than one. And we might be interested in understanding how the conditions that these different populations are experiencing are rippling through the population projection matrix to cause these differences in lambda. Why is population three growing? What makes it different from population one that's stable? Um, and that's really what life table response experiments allow us to explore. So an LTRE decomposes the difference or variance in lambda amongst multiple populations into contributions from the matrix elements and their interactions. And the reason that this is really important can be demonstrated with this example from um, ground squirrels. And we're actually gonna come back to this example in some of the, the worked examples. I'm gonna show you an R at the end. Um, so this is a study published in 2001 where they did an experimental manipulation and they reduced the density of individuals in, uh, in an enclosure. So they have a control population and then a treatment population. And the treatment population had higher uh, vital rates. So, um, and this plot shows the differences in the fertility and survival of individuals of different ages. And what you see is that the biggest difference um, was seen for the oldest individuals. So they saw the biggest bump in their fertility and survival. But once we take into account the sensitivity of lambda to those various vital rates or entries in the matrix, what we actually end up seeing is that the contributions to the difference in lambda are greatest from the early life terms. So despite having really small differences at ages one and two, those differences, because lambda is so sensitive to them, actually contribute the most to the difference in lambda between the treatment and the control populations. So this is really the power of an LTRE, is that you take into account the observed difference or variance in those matrix elements and the sensitivity of lambda to those matrix elements. And we'll be focusing on two types of LTRE. Fixed design LTREs decompose the difference in lambda across two populations. So if you're 
interested in the particular two populations and you're asking why are they different from each other, this could be a control and a treatment population, or it could just be two different lakes and you want to know why are they different. Um, then you use fixed design. And in a random design LTR, you decompose the variance in lambda across a set of populations. And in this case, you're not as interested in the particular settings or conditions of each population. And you're thinking of them as random samples from a large space of possible conditions that a population could experience. And it's important to note that these methods were introduced into ecology by Hal Caswell in 1989 and 1996. So I'm going to quickly run through the classical methods that were introduced by Hal Caswell and that have been in use for several decades. In fixed design, as I've said, we're decomposing the difference in lambda. So we have lambda of a treatment matrix denoted M and a reference matrix denoted R. And that's approximately equal to the sum of the differences in the matrix entries multiplied by their corresponding sensitivities, where the sensitivity is, a, is the derivative of lambda with respect to the matrix entry evaluated at A bar, which is the mean matrix or the midpoint matrix between the two that you're comparing. Each term in this sum is the main effect of a matrix entry. And importantly, no interaction terms are computed here. In random design, LTRE, in the classical methods, we use a variance-covariance matrix and multiply it by the corresponding sensitivities um, for the two matrix entries you're interested in. Um, this approximation includes main effects, so the terms with IJ equals KL, or the terms along the diagonal of the variance-covariance matrix, and second order interaction terms, which are all the off diagonal elements of the variance covariance matrix. Okay, so these methods have been in use for several decades and why, why do we need exact LTRE? There are a couple of reasons. The first is that as I've started to kind of point at, the classical methods compute only the main effects and only in random design are even two way interaction terms included. This is important because we know that lambda is a highly nonlinear function of, um, of the matrix elements. The second reason is that the computed terms are approximations. So we don't know how much of those higher order terms are being sort of shunted into the main effect terms um, and how far off we might be. So the paper includes a meta-analysis of more than 1,500 LTREs using matrices from the Compadre and Comadre databases, and we showed that cl the classical methods often give reliable qualitative understanding of the contributions, but not always, and there's no easy way to know when the problem will be big or small. And in particular, we consider the use of the mean matrix for evaluating sensitivities to be problematic, because lambda is such a nonlinear function of the population projection matrix A, we have found that in particular, the problem is big when that mean matrix doesn't predict the dynamics at the two endpoints or that you're comparing, or uh, if the mean matrix looks really different from the cloud of populations that you're comparing. So I'm now going to move into showing you an example of how to do exact LTRE. Um, rather than showing you equations, um, it's kind of a um, like a numerical method as opposed to a closed form analytical method. So we'll start with a simple two-stage model. There are juveniles and adults in this population. Juveniles survive to become adults at a rate J, adults survive at a rate A, and adults produce new juveniles at a rate F. So this is our simple, discrete time population projection equation. If we imagine that we have a control population and a population exposed to a pollutant, um, so I've made up some reasonable values for a uh, population, a control population in the lab that's growing rapidly. And then the pollutant has had a negative effect on all of the matrix entries and the pollutant exposed population is shrinking. So we have this really big change in lambda, negative 0.98. And we want to understand how much of the difference, delta lambda, 
comes from the lower juvenile survival, lower adult fecundity, lower adult survival, and interactions among those decreases. And to answer that question, we will do a fixed design LTRE, and we're going to do a directional analysis because we have a control population. So we'll be using the control population as our baseline. And I'll talk a little bit more about directional versus symmetric, but there's a lot more um, detail about that in the paper as well. Okay, so for now, just take me on my word. We're doing a directional analysis because we are comparing a uh, control and a treatment. To estimate the contribution of a juvenile survival, we set all matrix elements to their baseline or control values, and we only allow juvenile survival to vary from the baseline. So this first matrix that we're evaluating lambda of is basically a counterfactual matrix where we imagine a hypothetical situation where all of the matrix elements are the same as in the control population and the pollutant affected only juvenile survival. And so we want to know what is the contribution of juvenile survival if only that was varying. And we get a value of negative 0.296. So the contribution to delta lambda of the effect of the pollutant on juvenile survival is about 30% of the observed difference in lambda. We can do the same thing for adult fertility. We build a counterfactual treatment matrix where only adult fertility varied from the control and the contribution of adult fertility is negative 0.519 or about 50% of the observed change in lambda. Oops, sorry. So we now want to look at the interaction of juvenile survival and adult fertility. To evaluate the interaction of them, we need to know the effect of changing both of them at the same time. So we calculate the delta lambda of a hypothetical population where both of these variables changed, but not adult survival. And we get a difference in lambda of negative 0.672. But notice that here I have not called this the contribution of juvenile survival, of the interaction of juvenile survival and adult fertility. And this is because the effect of an interaction, the contribution of an interaction is the effect that it has on lambda above and beyond the main effects. So we have to take the response of the system, the change in lambda, when both of these variables are allowed to change from their baseline, minus each of the main effect contributions of juvenile survival and adult fertility. So we get a value of 0.143. So the contribution of this interaction is positive. It counteracts the negative effect of adult fertility and juvenile survival separately. And we can think through this biologically and come up with a logical, a biological explanation for this. Um, a decrease in adult fertility has a bigger effect when juvenile survival is high than when juvenile survival is low. Or conversely, when juvenile survival is low, the negative impact of low adult fertility is less severe. So this is I'm partly working to demonstrate that these interaction terms are actually really important and have biological meaning. And this is one of the things that we get to recover with exact LTRE that we don't get from the classical methods. Okay, I'm now gonna provide you with a little bit of advice for using exact LTRE methods. Um, and it's super important to choose the analysis that best matches your question. So we've come up with a couple of kind of um, silly uh, examples to help this stick in your mind. So if you want to understand the difference in lambda between a control and a treatment population, you might be thinking about comparing Bruce Banner and the Hulk. You can consider one of these to be a control, right? Bruce Banner is a regular human in many ways. Um, and you want to, and you're interested in the particular um, two endpoints, and you want to know why are they different, and you have a concept of a direction. You have a control and a treatment. Then you use a directional fixed design LTRE. On the other hand, we have a symmetric fixed design LTRE. So in this case, our example is that you're, you want to understand why the beetles differ from the Rolling Stones, but you don't have any reason to call one of them a control and the other a treatment. They're both kind of random samples of rock bands from the same era. And you want to understand the naturally occurring difference 
between these two populations. You're interested in them and the particular conditions that they represent, but you don't have any reason to call one a treatment and a control. This is a symmetric fixed design LTRE. And then in the case that you want to understand how variance in vital rates among populations across time, space, or multiple unordered treatments drives the variance in lambda, then you're sort of comparing cats. Domesticated cats in the US or many countries are just random samples from a large space of phenotypes. And we can just we, we just want to know what causes them to vary among the different populations we're comparing. This is a random design LTRE. The last thing we need to talk about is choosing maximum interaction order. So if there are M matrix entries that differ among your populations, you'll have two-way, three-way, all the way up to M-way interaction terms. And it becomes a lot of terms to try to parse and to try to plot and to try to make any sense of. With seven varying matrix entries, seven choose four gives you 35 four-way interaction terms. So that's not even counting all the other interaction orders. And in fact, um, if M is greater than 30, then the vector of all possible terms would exceed the maximum object size in R. So we have a hard limit that M equals 30 is the maximum at which you can ask for all possible interaction orders. But what does a four-way interaction term even mean? Like wh what story am I gonna tell about a four-way interaction term? So our advice is to calculate up to the three-way interaction terms and then you can calculate a final term that is the sum of all the higher order contributions. And you check that that higher order contribution sum is less than five to 10% of the observed difference or variance in lambda. This is not a guarantee that you've captured everything that matters, but it gets you a lot closer to being able to say that you've included all the really important dynamics in your analysis. Okay. So I'll now pause for questions or any general discussion about the exact LTRE methods before I switch over to um, walking through some examples. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand or pop them in the chat. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing and switch over. Yeah, anybody got any questions? Okay. Well, great. Um, I'm gonna switch over to our studio and um, you can download the code here. Um, if you downloaded it earlier, I have made a couple of changes, um, but you do not need to follow along. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, it's just so that you can play with it later. Okay. Um, Natalie, can you let me know, does this look big enough? Uh, I might make it a little bit bigger in case people are looking on laptops. All right. Um, so I'm just going to walk through some examples and talk you through a little bit of how to actually use these um, the functions and tools in the package, and a little bit about how I interpret some of these simple examples. Um, I'm gonna use the R compadre um, package to work with some matrices later in this tutorial, but if you have trouble with that, I've also included the matrices directly for you to be able to play with them. Um, if you have not previously installed our package, you can install it directly from CRAN with whatever your favorite way to install packages is, <laughs> and then load that library in. Um, in the package documentation, we include some really simple examples. So here um, we build three really simple um, three by three mo uh, matrix population, sorry, population matrices, um, which look like this. So you see they vary from each other. Um, we have reproduction in the first row and then survive, growth and survival variables in the lower triangle. Um, and we do include um, 
functions for calculating the classical LTRE. And so I'll just show you those quickly. This is to do to calculate the contributions to the difference in lambda. It gives it back to you like this um, for a fixed design. And for the classical methods, there's no um, directional or symmetric. It automatically uses the mean matrix and there's only one, one version. Um, and this is the sum of contributions from the um, classical method. And you see that it's it's pretty close. So that's probably okay, right? In by that metric. Um, we can also do a random design. Um, and that gives you this expanded matrix where, um, so these, this is the matrix of contributions along the diagonal is the main effect terms. And on the off diagonal are the um, second order interaction terms. And there's a lot of zeros because um, it's defined by position in the matrix. So um, this, it counts column wise. So this is element two, element six, seven, and nine. And so there are non-zero values in columns two, six, seven, and nine. Um, okay, we can look at the sum of contributions from the classical method and compare it with the true variance in lambda. And in this case, we see that's probably not, that's not so great. Okay, if we do these instead with the exact method, um, it provides the output to you like this. So um, these are the indices that vary to correspond with each of the contribution estimates. Um, and it's the same way I said before, this is element two, element six, element seven, and element nine. So each of these um, rows where there's only one element listed, that's a main effect term. And then this um, is the interaction of element two and element six. So you have to do a little bit of work to parse it out um, for how it corresponds to your matrix elements. And I'll show you that in the, um, the later examples. The sum of the contributions from the exact method are exactly equal to the difference in lambda. We can do the same thing um, for a random design. And we see that the sum of contributions is exactly equal to the true variance in lambda. Um, I'm not going to run through these, but I've also included a couple of examples. Um, the package includes calculations for generation time, R0, expected lifespan, um, and you can play with those examples uh, later if you want to. So let's move on to some examples with Compadre. So I'm first, I'm going to fetch the um, databases. And as I mentioned before, if you're having any issues with R Compadre, um, I think I found that there were occasionally issues with compatibility. Um, I've also included the, the matrices that we work with in these examples as an R data file on the GitHub link I shared. Okay, so we're first gonna work through this simple example of a fixed design LTRE with uh, white-bellied frogs. So Geocrinia alba are white-bellied frogs. This CDB flatten function extracts only the metadata so that um, you can look through it if you want to. The databases include a whole bunch of um, really useful metadata. And you can learn more about the variables that are available uh, by going to the user guide. And I've included the link to that here. Um, but here's an example of pulling out some metadata. Um, so all four of the models that are um, for Geocrinia alba were from Australia. And then this tells you which population they're for. So it looks like to me, there are three populations that were studied. And then this first row is a composite that includes the data from all three of those populations. Um, so I'm gonna pick two, I'm gonna compare Bruce Road and Forest Grove South. So this line pulls out just the matrices, um, just the A matrices, the population projection matrices. Um, for those two models. Um, 
And so the lambda value at Forest Grove South is 1.049. Um, and the lambda at Bruce Road is 0 0.8. So the Forest Grove South population is growing and the Bruce Road population is shrinking. And our difference in lambda is negative 0 0.248. So um, now we can use an LTRE to understand how the different matrix elements are driving that difference in lambda. Let's first look at how the matrix elements themselves differ between the two. So, um, so we have um, juvenile survival, adult survival, and fertility. And what we see is that at Bruce Road, fertility is much lower and the survival of both juveniles and adults is a little bit higher. Okay, and now we can use our exact LTRE to evaluate uh, how matrix elements are driving the difference. Here I'm using a symmetric design LTRE because I have no reason to call either one of these a control population. And so I set that by saying I want method equals fixed and fixed dot directional equals false. So we're not doing a directional analysis. And then if I plot that, can see here, um, bigger. This is our pattern of contributions. Um, we see that the main effect terms are the most important. None of our interaction terms are playing a big role in this uh, between these populations. Fertility, which was lower at Bruce Road, is the most important contributor to the lower population growth rate there. And the slightly higher survival for adults and juveniles uh, is counteracting that a bit. Okay, now we're gonna move on to this example with ground squirrels. Um, I've already picked out which two matrices I wanna compare. There was, this is an example I talked about when I had the slides. We have a treatment population where density was reduced within an enclosure and a control population uh, where density was not reduced. Um, and we can look at those. So this is a three by three matrix. Uh, fertility values are in the first row. Uh, the youngest individual, they reproduce in their first year of life. And then survival values are on um, the lower uh, triangle. And so our treatment pop, or sorry, our control or unmanipulated population is just barely shrinking. And our density reduction population is just barely shrinking and has a just slightly higher lambda. So they have very similar population growth rates. And our delta lambda is really small. But that doesn't mean that this will not be interesting. So how do the matrix elements differ? So um, here we have fertility of age one, uh, survival of age one, fertility of age two, survival of age two. We see that in the density reduction, age two individuals see a big bump in both their fertility and survival, and age three individuals see a small increase in their fertility and survival, and age one individuals uh, experience a decrease in both fertility and survival. Okay. So in this setting, should we do a symmetric or directional LTRE? We have an unmanipulated population and a density reduction population. We wanna compare here a treatment with a control, so it should be directional. And so we set that um, using method fixed. This has six, pop, um, six matrix elements that varied. So we're gonna try doing the maximum number of interactions is Maximum interaction order is three, and we do fixed directional is true. We want to do a directional analysis. Um, and then I've written this uh, very ugly uh, object that is all the X labels so that we can read this plot. So here you'll see that the, um, the main effect terms are generally the most important um, where these the reduction at age one in fertility and survival 
helps to counteract the increase at age two. And then we also have a couple of negative contributions that look relatively important from two-way interaction terms. So this one is survival at age one and fertility at age two. This one is for uh, survival at age one and two. And this one is um, fertility at age two and survival at age two. So this helps us understand that um, some of these interactions uh, combine with the reduction at age one to counteract this increase at age two. And that's what leads to these kind of, like essentially we're seeing a trade-off, right? Where the actual Lambda is very stable. Um, it's very similar between the two treat, the control and the treatment, but we actually have pretty big contributions that are kind of canceling each other out. Um, our difference in Lambda is 0 0.0009, but these contributions are 0.15. They're several orders of magnitude bigger than their sum once we add them together. We'll also check here that the contributions are within about 5% of the true variance in lambda. And we find that they are very much not. <laughs> because the difference in lambda is so small, a little bit, being off by a little bit looks really big. Um, and so here we see that the maximum interaction order of three was not sufficient, and we would need to go back and reevaluate what to do about the higher order interaction terms. I haven't written that out here, but we'll um, we'll look at that in another example. I've also written some code here to look at how the interpretation changes when we switch between symmetric and directional LTRE, um, but I'll leave that for you to play with on your own. Okay, the last example is a random design LTRE. So here we're gonna use Aliaria pediolata or garlic mustard. And there are three populations. So um, all three of these matrix matrices are from the Ives Road population and they're from three subsequent years. So we wanna look at the variance in Lambda across the three years at this Ives Road population. We pull out the matrices and we calculate lambda for the first year is 0.97, second year 0 0.968, 0 0.973. So they have really similar population growth rates and we see um, really small variance in lambda. But the last example should have helped us understand that that doesn't mean that there's nothing interesting going on with the matrix elements or their contributions to the variance in lambda. So we calculate the variances in each of the um, matrix entries. Oh, I should show you one of the one of the matrices. They look like this. It's three by three. Um, and what you're actually gonna what this actually is, is there are seedlings, rosettes, and flowering individuals. Seedlings survive and stay seedlings with a high probability. They progress to rosettes at a very low rate. Rosettes progress to flowering individuals also at a fairly low rate. And once individuals flower, they die. But flowering individuals produce both seedlings and rosettes. Okay, let's look at how these vary. So this is survival of seedlings, growth to rosettes, growth to flowering, the production of seedlings by flowering individuals and the production of rosettes by flowering individuals. And you see that the big, the only one that really varies is by a by a lot, <laughs> is um, the production of seedlings by flowering individuals. So now we run our exact LTRE. We get a couple of warnings, but those are because the reproductive in individuals can produce two types of offspring. And this warning is just to prompt you to double check that your uh, matrix is specified correctly. Um, but because we have two different types of um, offspring, uh, we get that warning, but it's not a problem. Okay. So now we plot our results. Oh, that didn't work. Um, sorry about that. Um, sorry. 
Okay. So we're choosing a maximum interaction order of three and we've specified method random. Hopefully that will now plot. There we go. Okay. So this tells us that even though the production of seedlings by flowering individuals was the most variable um, element, it's not the most important element for determining the variance in lambda. Even though growth of flowering individuals didn't look like it varied as much, um, it actually contributes the most to variance in lambda. And that is counteracted by these um, interaction terms between the growth to rosettes and growth to flowering individuals and the growth to flowering individuals and production of rosettes. So again, this is kind of a story of trade-offs where this population is uh, not showing a lot of variance in population growth rate between years because of the ways that the, the changes in matrix elements kind of balance each other out, the way that they co-vary and the, the way that lambda depends on their interactions. Let's check again that the contributions are within about 5% of the true variance in lambda. That's not looking great. That's really not looking great. Okay, so we definitely need to do maximum interaction order is all. So let's check that. And luckily, none of these four um, four-way interaction terms or the five-way interaction term have really big contributions to the variance in lambda. But remember, because things are canceling out like so much, these tiny positive ones sum up to something that looks really big compared to the true variance in lambda. So we needed to plot these. We needed to look at them to say, well, they're not zero, but they're not as important as the stories we're going to tell with the, with the elements that are over here. Okay, and that is the end of what I wanted to share. So, um, yeah, now we can take questions and discussion. Great, thank you so much, Chrissy. Um, remote, like, clapping noise. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we had a couple of questions that came through a little slow at the halfway point, so I thought I'd wait till you finish. So one question was, can you use this method for other features other than Lambda? Um, you absolutely can use the method for other features, but that is not written into the code. Uh, if you want to do that, um, please definitely get in touch with me. Um, I'm interested in expanding the package to have more broad functionality like that. Um, and collaborating with someone would be a great excuse to uh, do some more software development. Cool. And then another question was, is the difference going to always be exactly the same as the true difference, or I guess it will be the case when you consider all possible interactions. Yeah, so um, there's this like subtlety about the term exact. So when you calculate every possible interaction term, then yes, it will always match the true difference or variance in lambda. When you choose a lower interaction order, you can calculate that additional term that is the sum of everything bigger than that. But because terms can be positive and negative, it, you know, like you might lose a little bit. Um, but we still, it's still important to remember that each of the terms you are calculating is exactly correct in the sense of this, this simulation approach. So it's based on this, um, framework called Ethanova that we talk about more in the paper, but I haven't really talked about today, which um, is a is functional analysis of variance. It allows you to look at these really nonlinear functions and evaluate how much these different features contribute to them. So I, I hope that answers your question. And yeah, your intuition is right that when you consider all possible interactions, you'll always get the exact difference back. Uh, did anybody else have any questions? 
give people a few minutes in case people were typing. Um, just to note to people, I know sometimes when you come in a little late, you can't see the chat from before that. So I've pasted the GitHub link again, just in case anybody missed that. Um, yeah, I mean, feel free to, to pop a hand up if you'd like to just shout your question out. Or even pop a hand up if you're in the process of writing a question so that we don't <laughs> disappear. I had a very quick question about the, the code that you were running. So a lot of the code near the end, it kept coming up with a warning message about the matrix. Is that a warning message that we should be worried about or not? Yeah, so that warning message is to prompt you to double check that you've specified your matrix well. Um, we have some checks in there to make sure that you don't have unrealistic survival values, so you can't get spontaneous production of individuals. Um, but because you only provide your A matrix to the function, it has to make some assumption about which entries are fertility entries. So if you have fertility values that contribute to any elements of your matrix outside of the first row, then you're going to get that warning, but it's probably spurious. Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm saying that like slowly enough, um, that the check takes the two through N rows of your matrix and calculates the column sums and takes that to be your survival. Um, but if you have fertility values outside of row one, then those are going to make you make it look like you have spontaneous production of individuals according to this like kind of quick check we're doing. So um, it prompts you to double check that your um, survival and fertility values are uh, estimated correctly. Cool. Always good to have a double check for those kinds of things. Um, OK, another question here, uh, which is, have you evaluated in the paper the average magnitude of the error when using the classical LTRE method? Yes, that is a big, big focus of the paper. Um, we did a meta-analysis of over 1,500 LTREs from the Comadre and Compadre databases. Um, so yeah, I encourage you to go look at the paper. Uh, we estimated, we used um, the norm of the difference between the contributions calculated by the classical method and the contributions calculated with the exact method to define our errors. Um, and we also partition that into approximation errors. So errors in terms that are present in both methods and truncation errors, errors that come specifically from leaving out higher order interaction terms. Um, so yeah, there's a big analysis of, of how errors uh, arise in the classical method. Thanks for asking about that. What's your favorite species out of all the many LTREs you did? <laughs> um, I really like the little ground squirrel example. Um, I yeah, when I try to come up with examples for talks, I like trying to find something that I think is kind of cute. Um, and the garlic mustard makes like a cool uh, example because you get trade-offs and things in it, but um, they're not like the most charismatic uh, plant necessarily. Um, <laughs> I like the cute fuzzy animals. My background is in fish, so I'm also very partial to uh, fish. <laughs> There's all the botanists now going crazy. How dare you call that? I know. Plant. I'm sorry. That's I'm trying fine. to learn a lot more about plant life cycles. Um, and they are really, really fascinating. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry for all the, all the folks that love garlic mustard that I've just offended. <laughs> <laughs> so don't think Oh, no, we've got another question. Excellent. So this person says they're new to matrix models. Um, how do you decide what amount of contribution difference is important or not? Like, is there a general threshold or a kind of rule of thumb that you use? Um, I generally wouldn't use like a numerical cutoff. Maybe I would think about some percentage, like when you're looking at and it, like, for example, a PCA analysis, and you're thinking about what percentage of variance is explained, and you might have some ideas that if it's not explaining at least 10% of variance, then it's not a really important contributor or something like that. Um, but usually, um, like the way that I went through looking at those plots, I usually try to pick out in interpreting an LTRE result and the contributions, 
I'm trying to pull out which elements are the biggest in absolute value, which ones have the biggest positive contribution, which have the biggest negative contribution, and how does that help us tell a story about the dynamics that are happening in that population? Um, I would report all of them. I would report the whole bar plot. But then the stories, the interesting parts are the ones that are bigger, right? Um, it's not that it's not that it doesn't matter that there's a small contribution from, you know, age seven survival, but it's not driving the population dynamics. Yeah, like most statistics beyond a certain point, it's all philosophy rather than <laughs> like actual rules. So it's really about thinking about your question, I guess. It's a, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. So I think I think you might be off the hook. Do feel free to like wave at me, anybody, if, if there's a, a burning question that you're just struggling to type up. Um, but otherwise, I think we can, uh, you know, say massive thanks to Chrissy for being the first person to step up to do methods uh, live. And uh, hopefully we'll have another one of these for you for you shortly with uh, another uh, paper and a completely different topic. So have a good afternoon. And thanks again, Chrissy, uh, yeah. for all your help. Thanks so much for being here. And please get in touch if you want to talk about anything. <laughs>